listening to the Moist Boys Podcast. Yes. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Moist Boys Podcast. My name is Josh, and I'm here. We are sh- uh, shooting on location at each of our respective um, homes. <laughs> so, uh, it's good. the sound quality <laughs> might not be what it usually is, or what I hope it usually is. It might even be better, but uh, well, we'll see. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're going to go uh, reverse alphabetical order for our introductions because we got a big group today and it's a very special episode very well let's not go crazy <laughs> yeah um it's middling to fair <laughs> yeah uh but i'm josh i am jonathan best bro heather and i i'm the best hungry. bro heather harley fuck sorry hungry hungry harley yep um you know, I just thought yeah, about this, and first. we ta- we said we were going to go in reversed alphabetical order, Ooh, but I'm true. I'm mm. the best, bro. Yeah, we now people up. now people know what your real first name is, mm-hmm. and then yeah, yeah, that's right. The best, bro, Heather. There's some hype in uh, the best, bro, Heather. It's all one word. But today we're talking about a little film you might have heard of. Made a couple of bucks at the theaters. <laughs> at the cinema. Um, at the old yeah. cinema. Nice. The old cinema. Um, <laughs> Just a few. Talking about The Force Awakens oh. from 2015. Already four-year-old film, so oh, it's no. yesterday's news. God oh, damn. Right in the old. Ow. <laughs> Ow. Crap. My soul. Um, Ow. That was fine. Yeah, that was fine. <laughs> yeah. what, what to say about this movie that hasn't already been said? Well, uh, I, um, I mean... I, I, I'm just going to jump in and, and do my usual thing, write his monologue for like a good 30 minutes about how a, a film made me feel <laughs> in my special place. Um, what was that? Oh, I think, I think we can all agree at the beginning though, that obviously the prequels were better than the force awakens because <laughs> Jesus um, Christ. Absolutely. Well, George Lucas came yeah. up with an original story mm-hmm. and he didn't just rehash. Mm-hmm. He didn't bring back old characters like C-3PO and R2-D2 and, you yeah. know, unnecessarily bring in Chewbacca or Yoda. You know, he really kept it um, completely original in the prequels, unlike the hack J.J. Abrams, who just wanted to make a f- movie that people enjoyed watching. Seriously. And didn't <laughs> want to bang their heads against the wall until they bled to death. Yes. Curse you, JJ, for giving us exactly what we wanted, <laughs> which was more of the prequels. Yeah, so obviously this is not <laughs> this is a lot better than the prequels because um, I can actually want to watch this one every once in a while. Yeah, uh, unlike the prequels that I watch out of um, exclusively out of obligation <laughs> I, for the podcast at this point. Maybe yeah. a, little, a little bit of irony, a little bit of uh, obligation. It's basically just like a hate fuck in movie form. <laughs> Wow. I mean, the check it out. The I mean, I mean, I mean the prequels, wow. not this yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah, you're you're not you're not pulling a me right now. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Well, anyways, uh, before I was so rudely interrupted, um, I'd like to talk about this film and my special place. So um, anyway, um, what <laughs> this movie really meant to me, asshole. <laughs> Should we just give our clonies up front? No, 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 no. Go for it. You're good. Uh, no, okay. S- take it. Take it and run. All right, fine. Well, you know, so I guess just to paint a little bit of this picture for me and just showing probably how much of the bias I'm going to have whilst talking about this film. Like, The Force Awakens for me was really important because it was – obviously, it was like the first Star Wars film that I'd gotten really excited about since, you know, the prequels kind of being bitten by the prequels retrospectively. Um, Obviously, watching the prequels as a kid, loved them, kind of learned to – you know, not like him so much, and then just kind of outright just was not really into him at all, uh, falling back into the original trilogy as one would and should. But uh, the, the the Force Awakens, when that first trailer dropped, caught me so off guard because I was not really in a place where I was like embracing like my nerdism as much as I I should be. Like I wasn't reading comics, I wasn't really watching a lot of sci-fi. 
I like I wasn't playing video games at all. Um, so I was good just kinda, Lord, Harley. No, Blink I know twice if you're OK. Yeah, no, serious. It, it was a weird time. And I think I just, you know, I got busy and I fell into some <laughs> other stuff and I was just focused on my career and some other things. And it just didn't really it wasn't like a priority. And then this film, both in the hype leading up to it and then just in watching it and having it be just as good as it was I, I mean there's definitely some criticism which i think is fair to be you know thrown in this film um but i think all of that is just you know looking at the um series of trilogies <laughs> as a whole but i think for this film this film checked every box that it really needed to at least in that first viewing and, and pretty much was the catalyst for me like it was the first film that like kari and i went and saw where i was like kari i need to go see this i'm a huge fucking nerd i need you to go see this with me and so it kind of set us both on a on a path to the uh, mouth breathing neck beard that i would go on to you know find again in myself which is important <laughs> There's one in all of us. Truly. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> I, I actually thought about that one for a second. I was like, oh, actually. <laughs> that's that's not good. Can we back up here? <laughs> can I can I change my answer? Can I phone a friend? <laughs> yeah. Can I can I call an adult? But I don't know. Again, I mean, I'm sure we'll get into it. But this film was, at least for me in that first viewing, you know, the perfect balance of it was new. We had new characters. We had a new villain and a new plot line. And it set up just a lot of really interesting, really cool threads, which, you know, unfortunately, you'll come to find, you know, may have not have paid off due to a certain film that came out after The Force Awakens. But it definitely got me into the space where I just I was. I wanted to talk about Star Wars to everyone. Like, I was so excited to be back in this universe. And the fact that they really, again, like, just speaking volumes about, like, J.J.'s, you know, love and care and his, you know, I think, Josh, you put it the other day, his, like, uh, kind of Spielbergian vision, you know, really just... I, I don't know. This this film was a force to be reckoned with, if you mind the expression. I do. Um, but I, 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 I think fair. that uh, I think that quote was actually Jonathan's, if I'm not mistaken. I it could have been. Who knows? Or could have could have been double team. I guess that that seems a little too insightful. So I'm going to get yeah, that one. I don't I don't <laughs> say things unless I'm double teaming somebody with someone that, else. That is true. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Wait. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Um, so uh, throughout this uh, podcast, I think um, I'm going to pull up some of these wonderful uh, well, um, user reviews off of the old Rotten Tomatoes website oh, for Star Wars oh, oh. Episode 7. But why? <laughs> uh, no, no. Because they're hilarious. Oh, uh, this God. one, people still putting out reviews of this movie to this day. So I guess good on them for sticking with it. Like literally Jesus. to this day? Like this, this yeah. review came out today? Uh, the one, the one I'm going to read right now was five days ago, but there's some oh newer ones I can God. I can hit up to. Um, but this review, it's 1.5 stars out of five, <laughs> and uh, the quote is "Nice going, Jar Jar Abrams." So that's the kind of <laughs> oh, insightful. Wow! <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> oh, this is going to be rough. Buckle in, it. folks. Oh, there's more. Oh, there is. Oh my oh, God! No. There's there's more. I, um, I'm glad I'm sitting. Yeah, like, like the the context that this movie came out in, I think it's easy to forget now, four years on, because like we're everyone's so completely enveloped by Star Wars and Disney in particular. Yeah, that like, but at at the time this movie came out, it had been ten years since a Star Wars. And thirty two since a like actually good Star Wars. <laughs> that no one could have known. No one thought that this film was going to come out. Like no one thought that we were going to get more Star Wars. I mean, at least at, for me at the time when I saw that first trailer, like I was like, "Fucking no way!" Like this is this is a series that's no longer um, relegated or delegated relegated to like bad video game spinoffs looking at uea 
No, oh, so oh. many EA games. Oh, Lord. Yeah. yeah. Um, supposedly, they finally got it right with Jedi Fallen Order, but I, I have not purchased that yet, so I don't know. I have heard that's already being considered like one of the best games of the year, besides uh, Pokemon Sword and Shield. Well, there you go. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm not biased. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. What else did this clearly higher thinker have to say on the movie? <laughs> well, that's the whole review. Oh, okay. Thank God. Yeah. Yeah. But there's there's more reviews. So some here's, of them. like, the <laughs> thing that's weirding me out here. So, like, numbers-wise, this doesn't make any sense to me. So, on IMDb, this movie has a 7.9 out of 10, which that's relatively high. It's an, almost an 8. Then you go down to user reviews, and the first review is a 3 out of 10. Um. Oh God! Um, this just says <laughs> Disney has subverted Star Wars into one of its lame and boring childish films aimed at selling toys to preteens. I'm not going to finish reading the rest of it because this person's a fucking idiot. Um, <laughs> they are objectively that, wrong. <laughs> yeah, but that being said, 252 out of 301 people found this review helpful. Yeah. Well, you have to keep this in mind is that, again, as Josh said, people are reviewing this film right now. And yeah. I think this is this that, one's from December 4th of 2018. Yeah, that the, the, a lot of the reviews you're going to see for um, The Force Awakens right now, I would imagine, are going to be post The Last Jedi. And so you're going to be getting a lot of people just full on just review bombing anything Star Wars related because they didn't like that one installment. Yeah, that's, that's fair. That, that would be my as as someone who um, is currently dealing with uh, the as mentioned Pokemon uh, Sword and Shield and the whole Dexit controversy, and they basically people have tanked um, that game's review scores because they didn't like a thing. Oh uh, yeah, I'm sure I thought you were going to say as somebody who is currently writing a shit review on the movie right now, I can no, personally oh, tell you, <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, I, I would imagine that. I mean. I think in the grand scheme of things, as far as the overall score, like seven point what seven point eight, seven point nine, like that. Yeah, seven point eight. Yeah, like that's still. I mean, considering that, like an average film is typically on that kind of review board, like a five. That's a pretty damn good score. But um, I'm sure the review, the user reviews, are going to see a lot of that negativity. So that that honestly isn't too surprising to me, considering what the current climate is. That's post Last Jedi and post Solo too. So yeah. Which I guess people weren't like big fans of, supposedly. Yeah, most people don't like boring movies. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like uh, at least I'll at least like George Lucas can be happy that it's um like repaired his, his um his the people's view of him in some circles. So I guess. I guess there's a silver lining to that garbage cloud for him uh, specifically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, people using the R word talking about star Wars. That's, that's always cool. Now I'm reading IMDb, uh, <laughs> refuse. Oof. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. No, okay, I, so I, I clicked wait, on that. Wait, wait, wait. The top just four stop. of them just made me so mad. I it, almost had to like close my computer. Is that R word really good? Uh, it should be. Yeah, checks out. <laughs> so, so I, I, I'm curious, Josh. Like, what? I, I feel like maybe you and I might be on opposite ends of the stick here. What, what are, what are your feelings about the Force Awakens? Are you pro? Or are you con? Or are you, are you for? Did you like it? What do you think? Um, um, I liked it. I think, I think it's definitely my favorite of the Disney Star Wars movies. Checks out because it, it brings back like. And I've said this about other Star Wars movies, even that even if if the quality is good, they just they don't aren't. Yeah. And I think this brings back a lot of the fun that the Star Wars thing was missing. Totally. Um, I I think it gets there the opposite way that the original trilogy does, hmm. because when you're watching the original trilogy, it's not wall to wall. Everything's moving snappy along, and like. There's this nonstop action scenes, yeah. But it it does it in a way of the world building, whereas this there's not as much of the world building, but everything is it moves, it moves too fast to be not 
an entertaining ride. Yeah, it's it's a very kinetic film. Like I feel like you're just hopping from set piece to set piece like pretty pretty quickly and I mean it's all again, I mean JJ just has that eye for like Shakespearean or not Shakespearean, um Spielbergian, well, <laughs> Freudian slip there. Spielbergian um <laughs> like spectacle and so I, I think that definitely like this film just captures that perfectly and he also has a really good eye for casting as well yeah because i don't think he's ever miscast anything no that i can think of nothing comes to mind personally i don't know i again I like the entire cast of this film i mean i have just I instantly like i mean obviously they're part of a, a star wars film so they're gonna be you know it's, it's they're going to be big, but I, I feel like every single one of these actors in the role that they're playing, like they're so kind of perfect and lovable and relatable in their own way. At maybe at least in this film. <laughs> um. Yeah, I'll let I'll let somebody else hop in for a couple of minutes to. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, personally, I had some concerns when I initially saw like the cast reveal for this movie and I didn't know anybody. Um, but I feel like it's the movie is all the more better for that because star Wars has always save for maybe the prequels, which tried to rely a little bit on star power of like Liam Neeson and Ewan McGregor, um, Samuel L. Jackson, Samuel Jackson, Natalie Portman, um, Christopher Lee, Christopher Lee. Uh, but like these, the original Star Wars wasn't relying on like name recognition of anybody because they probably couldn't afford. They were nobody. Yeah, they probably couldn't afford like the big name actors at the time. Yeah. Well, and it's not. Uh, he probably could have afforded them, but he picked new people because he was building a new world, yeah. and he very much relied on. And they weren't nobodies, but they were not. Names. I mean, I think Harrison Ford was the only one of that original cast that like had really been in a big film being i think no i don't think yeah so. i mean george i mean he 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 was in american graffiti but I, I believe that george lucas also um directed directed right yeah yeah but i don't really think any of the other maybe maybe i would not say he was a household name at that point well actually i mean american graffiti was pretty big when it came out yeah. he's only in it for two seconds like well his his being a household name is building uh, weed compartments into hot tubs. So like he was a household <laughs> name in Hollywood. That checks out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I remember when I first saw the trailer for this movie, I did not ready myself in any, in any way. Like I just immediately got on the hype train. Yep. And I remember just being in the theater and was not really like, I I put my full trust into J.J. Abrams and um, the other, I mean, Lawrence Kasdan, uh, the other writers of the movie. And oh, I into... didn't know that Lawrence Kasdan had a had a hand in this. Yeah, really. My uh... yeah, him him and J.J. were like on set all the time. Oh, I love that writing it together. So yeah, that was it was nice to bring him back for that because I feel like. He was like b between him and uh, Irvin Kirshner, I think, were like the big, the the big uh, artistic powerhouses behind uh, Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, yeah. But I definitely remember sitting in the theater and just one hundred percent being along for the ride, and and it was absolutely everything I could have wanted it to be. Um. And so, like, within, and I honestly feel like everybody that I talked to about the movie kind of felt that same way. Yeah. So it wasn't until probably the next year that, um, like, the whole discourse over this being the worst Star Wars movie ever made and how J.J. Uh, Abrams just remade a new hope and it's, there's nothing absolutely, absolutely nothing original about this movie except for if you actually watch the movie. Yeah. <laughs> you realize like, like Joshua and I were talking about it the other day. Like if you, if you talk about this movie in the 
vaguest possible terms, it will kind of sound like a new hope. But as soon as any details are put in, it's, it's, they're not the same movie. It's meant to be an homage to those older movies, Mm -hmm. but it's, and I feel like that's a word that everybody completely forgot existed (laughs) when this movie came out. And so there's like a a fucking rip off. I'm sorry. Did you mean to say a homage? Get the fuck out of here. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I, I think as far as comparing it to the original ones, I think like one misstep they did make was star killer base yeah. and just making it just a bigger death star like i'll overlook it because it's kind of inconsequential as far as like the story goes like it's definitely more focused on wait wait, wait. how is that a mistake just as far as like it's a little too close to a new hope in the original trilogy so the original trilogy built a Death Star, and then they built another Death Star. And you're saying that by building a bigger, basically Death Star, but using the power of a sun and making it a planet, too is many a Death mistake? Stars. <laughs> that is one too many Death Stars in my my book. I'm sorry, you're right. We have too many iPhones as well because we're just going to continue building on a good <laughs> idea. Eh, that checks out. I mean, hey, <laughs> you know what? It's no moon, so. It's not. It's a fucking planet this time. I mean, if you, they built a weapon that destroyed many I things, guess, including an entire I mean, planet. And then they built another one, and that one also destroyed some things. So why wouldn't you keep building on an idea that's already worked for you? If we're going to get you? into the, the and then universe, I guess, rationale, then maybe it can be explained. But I mean, I think just narratively, like, I, I think what a lot of people were worried about is that it was just going to be another rehash of the original trilogy. And I think that... I mean, I think naturally it's like a form of kind of threat escalation and the fact that they did away with it quickly, just like in the original trilogy. And then at least I think they intended on moving on to maybe more of a darker, more kind of personal and intimate storyline in the next film, um, I think was kind of a good setup. Basically just got us back on board to the Star Wars formula and then kind of threw us for a loop. (laughs) But again, that's taking um, the following film, The Force Awakens, into consideration as well. The following film. This is The Force Awakens. The the Last Jedi. You know, whatever. You know what I mean. Harley. The Last Awakens. The Last Last Awakens. The movie. The Return Awakens. Harley just thinks every movie is Star Wars and they're all the same. They're all the same title. It's fine. Oh, you watching your Star Wars? (laughs) Yeah, Mom. Uh, Some. Someday Harley will be the the grandfather that buys his great his grandchildren like Thumb Wars because he doesn't know the difference between <laughs> oh, Star Wars no. and Thumb Wars. Yeah, yep. I mean, wait, there's a difference. Uh, um, at, at a certain level, yes. <laughs> so I so my my two two things that I on that honestly bug me about this movie though. Because, like I said, Star Killer, like I'm okay with it. Like, it, like, it, like Heather said, it makes sense in universe that they would do it. Like, yeah. whether or not you think it's not original enough, like it doesn't bug me because yeah. it's it's a MacGuffin to meet all these characters and to get back into this universe. So I'm fine with it. Um, but the two things that do genuinely bug me are like the Wrath Tars. I think are ugly and kind of goes on too long. <gasps> oh, I love the Wrath Tar. Um. It's just, it's just a little bit too much happens in that, and it kind of seems to go on a little bit long. So, like, if they shortened a little bit, I think I would have preferred that. Yeah. But, but like, it's it's all it, it's a good it's a good bathroom break scene for me because I know nothing consequential <laughs> happens in that. Um, but like the one decision that J.J. Abrams made, and I think to me, I think this is the best shot Star Wars. It, it, with the exception of it bugs me that all of the ships in this are shot from below. So yeah. you never really get a good look at them at any time, except for the millennium Falcon. Yeah. But like Kylo Ren's ship is always shot from below. So you never really get a full look at it. And I kind of always bugged me. Or I just wanted to just like one time, see what it actually looked like. 
That's true. Yeah, actually, I guess I'm I'm thinking about that now. It was like a very common shot throughout the film. Huh. Weird. I mean, it was yeah, either, like, either like you saw them flying from below or if they were landing, you kind of got like it was almost kind of like an upward shot. So you really couldn't even see the top still for some reason. Yeah. It was but all, even like the yeah, like the the ship that Harrison Ford or Han Solo captures the Millennium Falcon with. That's only shot from below. So you never actually see what that looks like. Yeah. Other than some brief shots. But. But yeah, it's like those are that's pretty minor. I mean, if that's your only, yeah, <laughs> if those are your only criticisms, I mean, that that sounds like a pretty damn good film. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Hey, Heather, what do you think of this yeah. movie? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I get really grumpy when I talk about this movie. Um, and this is going to be my 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 token woman perspective. I'm going to dig do in this for a second. Um, I get really grumpy when I have to talk about this movie because I'm so tired of defending this movie yeah. and how great of a movie it is and then getting thrown in my face well of course you'd think it'd be great ew wait really yeah Yuck. yeah i had that we said i've had that said to me and it's great that um in, you know it's in person yeah ew, ew. that yeah. yeah those kind of people just don't belong in your life you know they don't, but unfortunately, sometimes you work with yeah. people. Sometimes you have, you know, they're strangers. And sometimes you're married to them, you know, whatever. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> you know, and so I get really grumpy when I have to talk about this particular yeah. movie. And I where I feel like people forget because last, because last Jedi happened and that was so much controversial when it happened, um, which we'll talk about in our next episode when we get to well not next episode but next next episode when we get to that um but that people forget that this was also really controversial when yeah. it came out those star wars fanboys quote quote, who, unquote. quote 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 star wars fanboys who think they're the only fans who are allowed to love star wars get so bitchy and babyish about this movie that it's so just exhausting to to defend your opinion and i love this film i love this film from the minute it starts and i love this film all the way to the very end i love our characters introductions and how they're understated we have no idea who these people are we've never met these characters they've never met these actors you have no idea who they are so just have pose yeah you know character interaction be him negotiating for something extremely important that you've you've now been told that he's the best pilot you know he's the most trusted pilot so you know he's somebody important to meet finn in the way that we do and his panic attack his absolutely gut-wrenching indecision in his life is just like shattering and then we meet ray and we have no again we have no idea who these people are we meet ray and ray's introduction is so understated and it's so beautiful it's elegant, yeah it's very elegant you know i when we just recently rewatched this for the podcast i forget that her introduction has got no fanfare there's nothing she's just by herself scavenging and that's that's our introduction to one of our main characters and it's like that's insane that she has such a huge part to play but she comes again from such humble beginnings and i just i love this film from the get go i love this film all the way through the bromance that happens between finn and poe is my favorite thing on film <laughs> <laughs> I love, I it love dearly. I love just how confident of a ship you are on those two. <laughs> it's not even a question. I do. Like, I'm very it, confident. It, it's their yeah. If it, I'm yeah. sorry. No, if I'm uh, yeah. If if at the end of these at the end of this trilogy, it's just you know I don't nothing else could happen. Like everybody else could just magically fall over dead. But it was Poe and Finn walking into a sunset holding hands. I'd be happy. That's I all I mean. mad about it. Oh my! <laughs> That's all I can just imagine those the same mouth breathing fanboys like the the outrage over Kathleen Kennedy hey, like not only yeah. not only shoehorning the feminist agenda but also the gay agenda to our Star Wars. Oh my gosh! I know. Ah. Oh my Star Wars! Oh my Star yeah. Wars! 
I know. Nothing about Star Wars has ever been progressive. No, or inclusive. Never. Mm -mm. Yeah. No. You know, I just, I, I really like this film. I really like all the subtleties to it. I like, um, you know, there's there's some really cool flashes that happen. I love when Ray picks up the lightsaber and her flashing through all of these scenes and just like this it's so everything is well acted. Yeah. I love that Lupita is the little short yeah, alien. I love her Maz. dearly. I love Maz. And I love that it's Lupita because I'm just like, Your voice is so cute and I just love you so much. Um so going back So love, 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 love. <laughs> Um, going back to uh, Ray's introduction, I think her theme in this is maybe, and I don't think they use it, have used it in the subsequent film that we've seen so far up to this point. Like, I don't remember it popping back up again, but like, that's um, her theme might be one of my maybe top three or maybe even one of John Williams scores that he's written. It's just like, a, it's really great. Yeah. It's like a subtle kind of like orchestral sweeping sort of strings. Right. Uh, it's like a, like a uh, kind of flute solo yeah. Yeah, thing for most of it. That's right. That's right. But uh, yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to say right now, uh, Daisy Ridley might be like the, the casting find of the, I guess century so fucking far. Century, yeah. that was a fucking century. She is so amazing. She just every scene that she's in, she commands it. She commands your attention, and not just because she's gorgeous, but because which, she acts. I mean, let's be clear, which, she is. Yeah, she's very gorgeous, but she just she has such a presence, yeah. and she commands attention by doing very, sometimes very little. Mm-hmm. She can do very little, and can, and it's very and I and I say this with so much love um, that this is that one of the highest compliments I feel like I can pay. It's very Carrie Fisher. Yeah, Carrie Fisher could do that in a scene where she could just command your attention by doing nothing but making a face, and Daisy Ridley can also do that. And I, I kind of I think I feel like sorry. Go ahead, Harley. I feel like she she reminds me of Carrie Fisher if Carrie Fisher had. Millie Bobby Brown's like hyper expressive eyes. Like that's I don't know why it's just those two. Like that's the, I always I always feel like I, I I associate those two in my mind for some reason. Daisy Daisy Ridley and uh yeah Bobby Brown. Carrie Fisher with Rapunzel from Tangled. Yes, eyes. <laughs> exactly. I'm 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 down with that. Yeah. <laughs> I think that uh, Daisy Ridley also kind of falls into the same thing that um, that Joshua was talking about um, or will be talking about during our review of last Christmas. Oh, um, yeah. That like Amelia Clark, Daisy Ridley has that same like when Daisy Ridley smiles, the world smiles. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a, it's a very classic sort of, I don't know. Gravitas, charisma, something. Also, put Daisy Ridley in more things. People. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. Let's get on this now, please. Thank you. That too. Yeah. I would. I would say um, so that we don't uh, come off as too uh, of a certain way. I would say that if Lupita Nyong'o is in person in a thing, she also has that same characteristic. Oh, but absolutely. She, oh, she's, yeah. She's not. That's why I said I love that Lupita is is Maz. I just as soon as I found that Lupita was going to be in a Star Wars movie, I'm pretty sure I squeaked <laughs> like full on squeak because I love this woman. I love her yeah. acting. I love who she I is. I was kind of. I sad mean, we've also. Was... Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say I was I was kind of sad when I when I found out that she was going to be like a completely CGI character just because I I do really enjoy her presence so much. But I think it's, it came through um, with you know the mo the mocap. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, I have already previously stated on a different episode that I cannot remember off the top of my head uh, that Lupita is a goddamn national treasure. Absolutely. She fucking Absolutely. is. Oh, yeah. And then, but we couldn't, we, we didn't, we weren't sure of which nation that she was a treasure of. <laughs> we'll, yeah. We'll, so I said we'll the world's yeah, nation. Yeah, the world's nation. Exactly. Uh, and then I made a Bilderberger joke. So wow. I guess we just rehashed that whole video over again. <laughs> I well, mean, go. good job, all of us. It was so nice. We did it twice. Top tier. Um, by the way, the the nation, um, she was born in Mexico. Really? 
Huh? Yes. There you go. Mexico City, Mexico. But her father is um, Kenyan. Well, there you go. She, she was born. She was born in Mexico, and then moved to Kenya when she was one years old. Kenya. Nice. So Kenya. And then, pick a nation because she is the world's nation. Kenya. Believe and then, she, <laughs> and then she changed her name nope. to. <laughs> she changed her name to Barack Obama. Moved to the United States and oh. became the forty <laughs> fifth president of the United States. Forty uh, fourth. Yeah. Can we just? Can we just? Anyway. Um, <laughs> can we just not? Can we just can not? Just, can we, can we just not? Uh, also, want to uh, shout out. To uh, John Boyega, uh, yeah. good good American accent. Also, I'm, yes. I'm, uh, yeah. See, okay, so I didn't know that John Boyega was British until after Star Wars, and I went to go watch some an interview of him, and I stopped and was like, "Wait, what? <laughs> no." Since we're on the topic of beautiful expresses, expressive eyes, holy crap, this guy! <gasps> yes, he has such yeah. a beautiful little fucking face. I can't handle it. Seriously, oh, though. I'm sorry. The three can't. main actors in this They're movie. They're so adorable. I love them all. Yes. Oscar Isaac, John Boyega, and Daisy Ridley are just. Yeah. You just want to love them. I just want to have. You just want to hold them. I want to have and like a just pajama like, pillow party sleepover with them all and stay up until yes. like three o'clock watching movies, specifically, potentially, um, I don't know, Mean Girls. I don't know. Something. Something. something I don't want to watch movies. I just want to look in their eyes and tell them secrets. <laughs> yeah. Special, special uh, honorable mention to Adam Driver's hair in this movie. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Can we talk about my boy Adam Driver's hair and how <laughs> when he takes off his goddamn helmet the first time when she when she's like talking to him and she's, mm-hmm. she's like talk. She, she says something about him taking off his mask and he takes it off and I looked at his hair and went, nope. Mm-mm. It wouldn't. Nope. It wouldn't fit. That no. There's no way that you're wearing that helmet as often as he's wearing oh. that damn helmet, and that's what your hair looks like underneath. No, I'm sorry. I have been doing my hair for thirty odd years, guys. That is not what your hair looks like the in a o- helmet, hat, or anything. The only way I believe it is because this is sci-fi, and I'm sure there's some sort of like space magic as far as keeping no. your hair so voluminous. It is. It is force. It's the force. He's using yeah. the force on he's, his goddamn he's, hair. He's literally there you go. force lifting his roots. Because whoa, God, you heard this it here is, first. You heard it here first, guys. By the way, I love Adam Driver in this movie, yeah. and am very sad that in later movies he starts to look a little greasy and grease monkeyish, and <laughs> just not not what I want. It checks out. He's. I mean, yeah. He's, everyone in this film is extremely. It's it's a very beautiful cast, and it's a very it's a very perfectly cast cast, I guess. It is. Um, so to break from my typical um, complaining about droids breaking the 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 immersion of the world of Star Wars with the prequels and having more out of control um, opinionated robots, I guess. Yeah. That make it less and less likely that people don't know that that's a thing. Um, I will say that uh, on first watching, and uh, probably he still probably slept there. Uh, my favorite part of this film was BB-8 and uh, the thumbs up scene. Please be the thumbs up scene. <laughs> that's that's probably like the that was like the first big. That was I think that that scene, when like in the chemistry that. Uh, John Boyega and Daisy Ridley and BB-8 have together yeah. was when I was able to like, okay, like we're in good hands. Everything's yeah. good. Like it's comedy. And I'm, we're going to talk about this again with uh, The Last Jedi. It's comedy, but it's comedy that fits in the tone of the scene that's happening around them. Yeah. It's yeah. situational comedy instead of jokes. Exactly. It's It's, yeah. it's not zingers or kind of shoehorn Pratt falls and, yeah and also josh you complain a lot usually and and it's not that you're complaining it's that you have frustrations with the Shut fact your that, bitch ass mouth <laughs> no, i get where your frustrations come of like this is like why are the doubting these these androids or these or these droids because they're we've been shown time and time again that they can have minds of their own. This movie does that for you. They do not go, oh, a droid has it, whatever. They're hunting BB-8. 
They yeah. are not taking it this lightly that a droid has this map. They're going to find that fucking droid and they're sending people after it. I not mean, like one or two people. They're sending people <laughs> after they, that They droid. did kind of make their mistake the first go around when they let those two little asshole droids get away in the escape pod. So, I mean, I can imagine yeah. at this point in universe, like, don't, yeah, the first order these... very much learned from the Empire's mistakes. Yeah, being a bunch of Empire fanboys, I'm sure that's like page one. So I, I was, I always think it's funny because I, I, when I rewatched it, I was like, oh yeah, this does exactly what Josh wants all the other movies to do. Yeah. Don't take this lightly. Fucking follow that goddamn droid. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine that like in every single break room on every single Star Destroyer <laughs> and like every single like cafeteria on Starkiller Base, there's a post. Yeah. It says those were the droids they were looking for. Yeah. <laughs> Don't fucking do that ever again. Don't let it happen to you. Don't let it happen to you. <laughs> they are always the droid you're looking for, there's, even if they're not. <laughs> there's definitely a first order training module that takes you all the way through how to properly yeah. really fucking identify a couple of rogue droids with plans of some sort. <laughs> it's always the plans. You know? Yeah. Um, before we get too far away from the droid, droid talk um shout out to bill Hader and ben schwartzman for just schwartz ben schwartz just ben schwartz. schwartz jason schwartzman ben schwartz there it is. Um, <laughs> for uh voicing bb8 um you can definitely tell that there is someone Ooh, behind wait you didn't know this wait you didn't john ralphio was bb8 john ralphio yeah. was bb8 and i'm not sure what bill Hader did but he he also did some voice stuff for BB-8 as well. Just a couple beeps and boops. Fuck, I love that. <laughs> yeah, there's um, legitimately footage of Ben Schwartz like in the uh, the sound booth, and he's like recording dialogue um, that they then translated just like into the noises that BB-8 makes. Oh, and so it's like getting like his inflection and like turning that into droid noises i fucking love that so i now much. need subtitles underneath yes. bb8 yeah or commentary of it being ben schwartz voice yeah and then you're while the beeping is happening the like droid noise is being made so that <laughs> oh i know what God. he's saying oh, but i'm yeah, also that. hearing ben schwartz talk yes. like I, I want that cut of the movie yeah, where they put his schwartz dialogue cut. in Yes, I, I, you Schwartz know, if I, I yeah, cut. I need the Schwartz cut. Yeah. If I can't get his voice, I at least need the subtitle. Well, there is, there is out there, you can find it, a uh, YouTube video of someone put some of John Ralphio's dialogue over top BB-8. <laughs> uh, that's a pretty great video. I really like that idea. Get on it, JJ. I need this. Schwartz Get on it, it, science. Yeah, right. Somebody, somebody make that. Excuse happen. me, Disney. There's a market for a Schwartz cut. Really? We have coined that term, but yep. can you get on that for us? Schwartz. Yeah. Nice. Hashtag release the Schwartz cut. <laughs> there it is. Give us the. Uh, give us the Schwartz. So somebody that we have not. There's a couple people we haven't talked about yet, but somebody that I want to call out really quick. Um, who gives an amazing performance and boy, howdy, do I really hope that continues into the next movie? Simon Pegg. <laughs> uh, Domhnall Gleeson. Oh, yeah. Yeah. God, he's so commanding in this movie. He really is. He is commanding he's daddy. in general. Yep. Yeah, is this, daddy. Is, yeah. this is going to sound really bad, but he's so Hitler-esque. Oh, yeah. No, it's just in this movie. He's very scary. And it's so on point. Yeah. It is. He's so, like... That he's such a captivating speaker and he's such an aggressive, like he's pushing such an aggressive thing. And yet you're like, you, you can almost see people being like, I'm swayed by this guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, it's he, just, he has that sort of yeah. dark, dark charisma to him. Like, yeah. which is exactly what, you know, a, a, a group like the first order would totally be rallying behind. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Like the scene, the scene where they fire Starkiller base yeah. as he's making that speech to the troops. God, like, it's... holy shit. Just like my whole body just gets chills yeah. every single time. I mean, for that one moment, he is probably the, the most like, I would say the most threatening villain that Star Wars has had. Maybe besides like pre, you know, family ties reveal Vader. Yeah. Yeah. Like. It, 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 you know, and honestly, it just it would be a real shame if uh, they they took that <laughs> and 
just rendered it kind of innocuous and the, well, the, just and fucking I, dunk on him for two and a half I, hours. I mean, I, I, I imagine, you know, they did such a good job of setting his character up. I'm sure they wouldn't do that, but you know, it'd be a real, it'd be a real fucking shame if they did. And they really yeah. do set his character up. We, we talk about this scene, this, that yeah. amazing speech scene, but let's just talk about who this man is. Like he goes, Oh, nose to nose with Kylo Ren, who is one of the most terrifying Sith lords since Vader. You is know, he, I mean, is like, he a Sith? He's, or, I mean, he just, technically he's very, a Sith. Or is he just like mm. a, he's a knight of Close Ren. enough. Yeah. He's technically a Sith. He's as much of a Sith as there are. There is a Sith now. I, mean, I guess like, that's, I guess that's true. <laughs> like that he's following the dark side. He's against. You know, he wants to rule the universe, so I'm gonna go with yeah, yeah. Sithy. Very well, Sithy like. That's the one thing that's interesting though about these films is that I don't really know if there's any there's any reference to the Sith. Like obviously Snoke, you know, talks about like utilizing the dark side of the force, but I think I don't because I feel like in, in universe the Sith is almost like it, I mean it literally is a four letter word. And I don't even think that they use it, so I don't know. Yeah. It I'm trying is to used, I want to say it's at least used once in uh Last Jedi. I cannot remember off the top of my head if they use it in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. But uh, regardless. Anyways. Anyways, anyway, so he to... goes he goes toe to toe with Kylo Ren and in this movie holds his own. Yeah. Well. And he, you know, he's he's able to walk in. Most people, there's no way most people are just walking into an audience chamber with fucking Snoke. Like that's just not gonna happen. Yeah. And be able to, you know, captivate and be praised by that person. Yeah. I'm not gonna say man. Per- I'm not thing, really sure what thing. Snoke is. <laughs> shade, um, shade of a man. Yeah. 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 You know, it's he's he is a huge villain he's a huge character on his own and just by his actions not not just because don gleason was a commanding fucking actor through this movie and snoke was literally a giant villain in this film (laughs) hey yo hey yo well i just but that's go for it sorry i was just gonna say that like one of the things that i'd forgotten about this movie until rewatching it is that um Hux is Kylo Ren's equal, if not slightly above him yeah. in terms of like the hierarchy. Where they, the hierarchy. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. So yeah, he, and so like actually having Tarkin. those two. Yeah, I feel like. But like even with Tarkin, no, Vader, Vader was above Tarkin. You could tell Vader was above Tarkin. Yeah, he was listened to more. He was given but bigger missions. He was more integral into what the Emperor and the Emperor wanted done. I don't because i mean uh, vader did listen to tarkin though yeah and there, he and, did but he but tarkin also listened to vader and there but there's that line that uh princess leia says when she first gets captured and is like brought into that main command room where she basically looks at vader and and, and tarkin and is like oh i see that tarkin's still holding you on a short leash or something like that given something to that effect yeah, yeah. so I, I mean maybe i just interpreted that differently but that's definitely the kind of relationship that i saw between these two is like maybe maybe one's above the other but regardless i think they're both both in their own way trying to kind of like maybe usurp the other in a sense or at least you know come away with the bigger slice of the pie it's it's one of those things where like i feel like hux what has been in this position for a while he's worked his way up to this position yeah under snoke's command of this first order and then this fucking kid comes in yeah and is snoke's like new favorite pet Mm mm-hmm and it's kind of just like because they're very like snipey to each other. Oh yeah, and like it is not that is not a good working relationship where like <laughs> Vader and Tarkin. I feel like there was a mutual a mutual respect between them. They're just old. <laughs> they're just older. Yeah, like <laughs> older, wiser, bunch of boomers. Uh, yeah, they didn't have <laughs> fucking time okay. for this shit. Okay. Oh, okay. They were uh, they were like, they were they got, they got too old for this shit. They literally yeah. and figuratively. Yeah. Yeah, but like th- these two don't have that respect between them no um so one of the things that i've been thinking about a lot because um spoiler alert we did recorded our last jedi episode beforehand which we've been kind of dancing around on this <laughs> one. Why? Why would you oh my god we already have oh that in the can break the immersion i legitimately do not remember that 
at all. <laughs> but um, I don't think you were there, Harley. It, it might have been the gin. <laughs> Probably. The gin. Um, but one of the things I've been thinking about, because both both this movie and The Last Jedi begin with Poe Dameron kind of... Being a flyboy. Being, well, like, he he's like, tries to, like dunk on the on the bad guys a little bit he does it in um force awakens to kylo ren and then in the last jedi to um general hux or hugs as he's called in that movie <laughs> um and i and i was trying to think of what what made it work in this one where it's genuinely funny and like it tells you a lot about the character and in the other one like i would like my asshole clenched every time <laughs> they went through their routine again and I realized, like, the difference is, in this movie, Poe Dameron's just, like, throwing jokes out at Kylo Ren the whole time. And Kylo Ren just ignores him. And he's not reacting to it. There's no cutaway shots to, like, all the First Order people, like, snickering behind Kylo Ren's back. But in The Last Jedi, it's, like, everybody dunks on General on, on Hux yeah, throughout yeah. the whole movie. And it's, like... It's like when you're making bad guys, you don't have, don't have everybody dunking on the the your threats to the main character, and like I think that's like that that's the reason why that Last Jedi didn't work, and it's it's pretty ballsy to to begin your Star Wars movie on a on a prank call and a Yo Mama joke. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oof. So, but it, but this like it really worked because it told you like you know Poe Dameron. He's he's a uh, maybe not go, too bright, but he's a <laughs> he's a fly boy. Yep. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with it's because they were better jokes too. Like that too. Oh yeah, it's they're oh, more 100%. again. Again, it's it made situational sense. humor yep, and is. not jokes. You know, it's I can't. It's hard to understand you with that mask on. It's not a joke. He's literally just saying a line that somebody might say, but yeah. the way he delivers it makes it funny. Yeah, yeah. and very much just like the first the first thing. When, like, Kylo Ren is just staring at him through his mask. He's like, so what happens here? Do you talk first? Do I talk first? Like, Do you talk first? What, what is it? I, the, I, I, yeah, I think it's just it comes down to it just being more situational. And I think just maybe a little bit more believable to the kind of character that they were trying to portray Poe as. Whereas, again, I feel like the Yo, the Yo Mama joke, the, the, the prank phone call, like, that's a very... It's a very early like, '90s joke. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. gonna say it. I was gonna say it dates itself, but it doesn't even date itself. It's like a, it's almost twenty year old joke at that point. Yeah, but I mean, maybe that also, you know, maybe one could read and I mean, again, this isn't this isn't a review for the the Last Jedi, so I'm not going to try to get too into it. But like, maybe that's more of just <sighs> demonstrative of Poe's change in his persona, like in this film. You know, things are still a little urgent. He is still a little on his toes. But whereas in the beginning of The Last Jedi, or yeah, The Last Jedi, you know, he's coming off a big win. He's feeling very confident to the point where basically no one really can trust his judgment. I don't know. I'm I'm trying to rationalize what that stark difference was and why it was so not what we wanted. <laughs> I think it comes down to who wrote it and who directed yeah, I was it. Say, yeah. writing. <laughs> I think it comes down to writing. That, that checks out. That tracks. <clears throat> so I guess one person that we haven't really talked about yet at all, um, the man uh, behind the giant, you know, holograph was uh, Andy Serkis, right? He did the mocap. Yeah. First, first snow. Yeah. And the voice acting. And the voice acting, yeah. I think it's kind of crazy being four years later and now having seen, you know, the, the following film. I remember when we when I first watched The Last Jedi, I know that not only myself, but a lot of other people were convinced that Snoke was actually just a giant thing. Like, he, that was a hologram, but he was also just that big. Yeah, And I remember that being like a really big point of contention with people. And it just makes me kind of laugh in retrospect. <laughs> but to be fair, he's like seven foot five. Yeah, I mean, he's still a very tall bloke. But like, again, I, I feel like what the, the assumption was, it's like, no, he, he is actually just a giant, like, alien. Like, that is yeah. how big he is. Ergo, he is the big bad. <laughs> and then, of course, that spirals into all of the various, you know, 
not to be limited to Darth Plagueis like um, <laughs> uh, kind of rumor mill. And and honestly, that that was probably some of my favorite like post film conversation pieces. Like, who the hell is Snoke? Like, who the hell is Ray? And where does she come from? But I don't know. I, again, I, I just I'm I've always been very impressed with how this film kind of sets out. Um, kind of sets up its different little plot pieces and leaves them hanging enough to incite that sort of conversation. Yeah, it sets up the next movie to go somewhere. It'd be a real shame if they, uh, <laughs> you know. Forgot about that. Dad and... um, I just want to, this is the first time I've seen it. I think it's the first time I've seen this. I definitely don't remember noticing this before, hmm. but apparently, um, I don't know if it's the same person i want to click on the name to see if it is uh nigel godrich was one of the stormtroopers he plays fn 9330 oh no kidding is, is that the um that's the traitor the one that has like the double sword that like comes at finn i would have no idea i think so that 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 serial number makes sense can can you can you can you read it again fn 9330 uh, tr adar was not an actual oh Call oh. sign. That's just what people call the, that character. Oh, I get it. Okay, never mind. Yeah, that, I think that's, that's, these, that's these are just people that were standing around. Oh, but uh, yeah, it looks like it is in fact the Radiohead um, producer. So wow, interesting. Very cool. That's cool. Also, Judah Friedlander was in this film in the Cantina scene. Wasn't Daniel Craig was the uh, stormtrooper that that Ray Jedi mind tricked into letting her out? The, yes, the stormtrooper yeah. with the bad American accent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, sorry, Daniel Craig, but you, it's it's not your strong suit. No. Uh, and I did actually mention this before, but Simon Pegg was the uh, the shopkeep in the very In Garplot. Garplot, yeah, and all of that crazy, uh, <laughs> like prosthetics magic and actually that's what i want to say too another big thing about this film that really got me 100 percent was it's just return to form for practical effects oh, and so locations real real locations practical effects actual puppets like i i love it all there's just something about it that just screams like star wars to me <laughs> like if i don't see some random like alien puppet in a small cage in like a street vendor scene like it's not star wars to me holy crap i'm looking at the imbd sorry harley for a no. second but thomas brody sagzinger was uh, a first order really? officer how did i not notice that for those of you who are like, who the fuck is how they're talking about? Um, he played Sam in Love Actually. He plays yeah. the little kid in Love Actually. And he's in apparently all the Maze Runners. I completely forgot about oh, that. Oh, that's right. I feel like I remember you see him very briefly. Yeah. Um, other people will know him as Jojen Reed from Game of Thrones. <laughs> yep. Yeah. You know, our, our first Game of Thrones um, sighting for this episode. <laughs> which i feel like is more of our uh shout out to our uh his dark materials when we're doing uh his dark materials oh <laughs> there are a couple of uh game of thrones regulars I in that say, series i was mm -hmm. like i don't remember those being pointed out before hmm. because... um... anyways i'm so sorry Harry. <laughs> oh, I, no. and I was like oh my no, god I mean, that, that was basically just my point just saying that like i i love practical effects like I don't get me wrong, like you can do big spectacles CGI and obviously this film and you know the subsequent film definitely shows that, but as far as just being like on on the ground, on location, like there's just something about having it be for the most part practical that'll just always have some like special magic in my heart and just I think it lead it lends to creating a more immersive um environment, especially like in a sci-fi film like this. Uh, also, shout out to Ken Leung, uh, who plays Admiral Statura, um, which I'm afraid he's probably one of the people that just was unceremoniously uh, blown out of the bridge on The Last Jedi. Probably. But hopefully not, um, <laughs> because uh, I always like when he pops up in things, because uh, I think he's an interesting actor that does. He's been in a lot. Good right? work. For our, yeah. uh, other Marvel fans out there, Hannah John Kamen was a first order officer as well. She played Ava or Ghost yeah. in uh, Ant Man and the Wasp. Oh, yeah. Actually, I mm -hmm. think I remember. Yeah, okay. 
That's cool. I can picture her. Yeah. Yeah. She's in like, yeah, yes, yes. Um, so like one of one of the big things that I actually wanted to talk about that always bugs me when people talk about this film. <gasps> Colleen Wings in the sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. she's the one of the pilots. Wait, oh, yeah, she is. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she's like Oh, she's also from Games of Game yeah. of Thrones, by the way. G- yeah. G- Games of Thrones. Games of Thrones. Also <laughs> Games, of Thrones. Games of Thrones. Um the only The Games of Thrones. The only good thing in uh Netflix is Iron Fist. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um Mm-hmm. Which put her in more stuff too. Um, yes. Yes, please. Yeah. And thank you. Yeah. See, Thanks. see. So we talked about again. We will probably talked about the last, the last Jedi, but I feel like they couldn't get her back for the Last Jedi, and I'm which I'm glad because I'm pretty sure she would have been the one that they just unceremoniously again unceremon- uh, unceremoniously killing off uh, good characters out of nowhere mm-hmm. at the beginning of that movie. But yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, speaking of cameos and the um, general public at large not understanding what a cameo is and is for, so um, Iko Uwais, known yeah. for uh, Uwu Assassins, uh, Uwu Assassins previous Assassins. episode. <laughs> Check it out; it's, it's in our <laughs> trifecta of terror episode. Oh boy! Or trifecta of terrible. Oh, oh, I think we went. Oh. I think I called it trifective terrible. Did you? We, yeah. Oh, nice. Anyway, we did that a couple months ago. It's a good yeah. episode. It's pretty Old fun. News. If Old you just want to hear point. us dunking on stuff, <laughs> I, feel, I feel like that's one of the few. Episodes. I mean, stuff that definitely deserves yeah. to be dunked on. Yeah. Get up and get up and slam. Welcome to the jam. <laughs> Go listen to that. Um, it's it's good to to get everyone together and just like dunk on something for a while. It it's like clears out your system yeah so um, why is, yeah. why is james crying because he just got dumped on <laughs> <laughs> little but, shout um, out to froggy fresh love you baby uh formerly crispy cream until yeah crispy cream came for him <laughs> that's how old they, i am they i know miss crispy cream um wow dated but um <laughs> I love but it. like one of the big criticisms of this movie and like big as in everyone was saying it because I feel like at some point it just became like a, a feedback loop of people wanting to dislike it, seeing what other people were saying and just repeating it. But like Iko Wyas plays um, one of the Guavian death. I think he's in the Guavian death gang or he's he in, in uh, Kanja club, Kanja club. Um, but like people complaining that he didn't have enough to do here. And like, my thing is, if you, there's, there's, there's a certain point, which we will, t- which we can again mention here, because I think it's almost as relevant to this one where you have someone like Gwendolyn Christie as Captain Phasma. That's not quite a character, but not quite cameo. I'm sorry. You you mean, can, do you mean Captain Fantasia? Yeah. Captain Fantasia. Oh man. I'm, I'm, I promise this is the last time I'm making this joke, but I can't wait to see what she does in the next movie. Hell yeah. But like, Uh, and that whole gang, like that is a cameo. Like they're not going to like everyone. I think everyone wanted them to do some white tie or like stuff in the scene. And it's like, that's not what a cameo is. And I would just like to remind people that when it's 10 years since the last time there was a good star Wars movie or a star Wars movie period, like you're gonna get actors that want to be in your movie, yeah. maybe not a character. Like, sure, I'll show up for a day and do a Star Wars. Why the hell not? <laughs> why? Why wouldn't you do a Star Wars? It makes right. sense. Yeah. No, I, I mean that makes sense. I, I didn't even realize that that was a point of contention, but yeah, I mean, I could imagine that that would maybe, yeah, be taken out of. I don't know. I mean, that's a point of contention in a lot of things, like yeah. people people being super aggro that uh, Matt Damon plays oh, Loki at the beginning of yeah. Ragnarok. But that's hilarious. Uh, it's hilarious. Yeah. Like, well, no, nobody was mad that Sam Neill was Odin, though. It's like, okay, fuck <laughs> all of y'all. Actually, I was, because I fucking love Sam Neill, and I want him in everything. But, I mean, I, I think my – and, and not, not to take the, the conversation in this direction, but I, I think the only time where some of that criticism is warranted is when you do have, let's say, an actor or an actress from a somewhat underrepresented, you know, 
potentially minority group who is just kind of thrown into a film like this in kind of a role and kind of like a like a barbaric role like i feel like that was like it's like that that one that one makes me feel like a little bit uncomfortable for a second and then i move past it but i don't know um well i I think this would not be the movie that you could make that argument on based on everyone else in this based movie on, based on the inclusivity of every yes yeah i mean like they're already accusing disney of being uh, uh um being being too inclusive yeah so um, <laughs> Ka- i'm gonna Ka- kathleen kennedy's uh, uh what is it her whole <sighs> I don't know. Whatever, man. <laughs> um, so here's here's another uh, half star get, review from uh, from Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, no. um, uh, quote: Woke Wars. Disney really <laughs> fucked that one up. Can somebody please bomb that stupid bounce to Nirvana? Bad cast, bad story. This movie will be forgotten in ten years. Oh, well, jokes on him. We're almost ten year or we're almost halfway through that ten year thing in this movie so i remember at least like 60 percent of the film so he can i don't know the fuck he's talking about (laughs) doing Um, all the drugs that yeah Yeah. um i would like to point out real quick just due to some slight technical difficulties we have lost heather i was was gonna say speaking of inclusivity where where did (laughs) where where did our best best bro heather go um so one of the one of the the threads that this movie sets up that I'm kind of disappointed was completely like even more forgotten than other ones that were cast aside for other things was the Knights of Ren. I think that is a really yeah. cool idea that something could have been done with. Hey, but it's okay, Josh, because, uh, you know, you'll learn all about that in the Kylo Ren comic book brought to you by Disney. Yeah. Yeah. But I want to see leave- in you action gotta some, you gotta leave some content for the uh for the side hustle you know yeah you gotta leave some of it on the table for next time yep. gotta gotta push them books and comics but yeah I, I totally agree and i well and it actually like this film shows them right this it's it's in one of the the flashbacks you actually see yeah. Milo with the knights of ren and it's a totally badass scene yeah yeah that's unfortunate i mean i hope they give it some sort of payoff at some point like even like oh yeah uh, he had to kill them all because he had to be the strongest or some shit. Like that would be and the fact that they did. I feel like that's such low hanging fruit just to establish like Kylo in the subsequent film as like even more of a badass. Like that would have made sense, but that that would make a good opening for the rise of Skywalker. I think to yeah. open it with, with that where you think that maybe Kylo Ren has already turned to the light side because he's fighting the Knights of Ren. And then you just find out that, he just wants to be the biggest he, badass. Yeah, it's basically just Thunderdome, and whoever gets to be whoever's the last man standing gets, gets to, to be um, Tina Turner. Gets to be Daddy. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so an interesting note on um, the Knights of Ren yeah. is that going into um, I don't know if you guys heard about this or not, but going into Rogue One, there was this theory because like uh, another like art book that was like the the world of star wars like art book had come out Mm. and it had detailed um like descriptions and like um artist renderings of the knights of ren and they all actually almost lined up perfectly with the cast from rogue one oh and so there was this like huge theory that like those people got captured and then like brainwashed and they were the Knights of Ren because there's literally one who has like a stick. There's one who has like a giant, like blaster. double handed blaster. Yeah. Um, there's like, I, I don't remember all of it. Uh, I don't remember where I saw this at, but um, like that would have been fairly interesting. And I wonder if maybe that was an idea they maybe had, but due to like, reshoots on Rogue One and um it's Ryan Johnson picking up the ball and um like hucking it across I wrote this like <laughs> over the fence. <laughs> like tackling his own teammates to get the ball. Yeah. Well actually well that's actually one thing that was interesting to me. I mean again, I know this isn't a, a conversation about Rogue One, but one thing about that first trailer for that film is that you see Jin um 
cast a who uh what was it josh felicity felicity huffman that was jonathan's Nailed joke oh that was, was it joke. oh okay, you son it. of a bitch no, sorry. <laughs> i know I, i'm mixing my uh, i'm mixing my maulers here um there's the there's a scene in the trailer Whoa, doxing much oh <laughs> <laughs> sorry we no, gotta get gotta get internet famous somehow so. right we, we can we can cut that one out and post <laughs> yeah right sure sure uh, Oh yeah, there's a scene where in the trailer where Jen basically is wearing like this black, um, it it, it, um, it looks like it's like stormtrooper armor, but looks like a little bit more badass, and it has like a little like shoulder shawl or something, like a little like shoulder robe. And I, I'm wondering maybe like that that could very well may have been like a little piece of that outfit because she looks very ominous. She almost looks like like the dark version of Jen. So. Uh. I don't know. Not to add more fuel to that most likely departed uh, conspiracy ship, but uh, two other things I wanted to <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, make sure that got mentioned because I feel like we um, forget John Williams every once in a while, just somehow. But um, the I have never once forgotten about John Williams. I literally wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, and the only words. On my mouth are Sean. But then on the podcast, you forget to say his name, so um, that doesn't count. But uh, uh, <laughs> the um, Kylo Ren theme, I really, I really liked. I think it's really effective. Yeah, it, it's kind of like it. It evokes the Imperial March without just outright copying it, which I mm-hmm. usually think John Williams is pretty good at being able to remix what he's written before like there's tons of youtube videos about how john williams like updates his his score and there's a bunch of uh there's a really good video i can't remember who it was by but about how um like all of the all of the new themes for this movie are like inversions and like reflections of previous themes then reflecting the um just for, like for the whole Star Wars saga in general. Yeah. Um, and then... I mean, there's a reason why he's probably, if not our generations, like even generations prior, like probably one of the the most herald, heralded and like celebrated, you know, film score composers. Like he's fucking amazing. Yeah. I think it's Does... like four, even five generations at this point. Yeah, yeah. Being the I'm top. Just been around for a long hey, time. Hey, Heather, welcome back. <laughs> Heather's here, not, but not on the call. Not, re- not really back. <laughs> oh, damn. Me and Jonathan traded out for a minute. <laughs> oh, check that. Okay. Like, well, um, welcome back, best best, best bro. Uh, thanks. We talked a bunch of crap. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's cool. We like, this movie's terrible. The the goddamn you know Kathleen Kennedy's feminist agenda. Yeah. Goddamn get woke, make two yep. billion dollars. Um <laughs> the get, get woke or die trying. Yeah. Um and then also like the scene where they the first time, or I guess it's the only time, but when they um fire the Star Killer base laser, like I really like how they didn't that wasn't action y, that was fair it was like a very more like operatic Melanch- style yeah. or Melan- kind of scene kind of melancholic even yeah like the score is like really beautiful and haunting also like kind of terrifying and like just the way it was shot is really good and yeah. really appreciate that um yeah so those were like the those are my the other two plus rays theme of like really really good john williams mm-hmm. score that i hope but we get and we get something new in the rise of skywalker totally well, and I feel like in a, in a much lesser film too. Actually, I'm I'm glad that you mentioned that specific moment where when the the Star Killer base fires is that I feel like in a lesser film that moment may not necessarily have had the same weight that it did because of the fact that we're literally just seeing a big beam and then you hop over to the planet that um, you know Harrison Ford and um, our other subsequent main characters um, are all on you know are, are watching those planets get blown up and it's kind of just like you feel almost detached. And I feel like in a lesser film with a lesser score, that really wouldn't have landed the way that it did. But because of that, um, 
Have that well, in a right? lesser film with a lesser score, they would have relied more on the sound of explosions, I feel like. Probably, yeah. But when you've got John Williams, man, you just you just put it in his hands and he's got yeah. you. It, it's it's it was it was I remember watch seeing that in the film and I think that that was almost our um again not to jump over to The Last Jedi too much, but that was like our um hold Holdo's sacrifice scene, like where it was beautiful yet harrowing and I don't know. Holdo? Holdo? Am I saying that right? Holdo. Holdo, yeah. Holdo the phone. Um, yeah, <laughs> Poe on the line. Hey! hey there now I'm doing it, too. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my nightmare. <laughs> oh, no, you've been dragged into Harley Land? Ah, ah, ah. No. One of us. One of us. Um, one of you. Just one of you. <laughs> that's, that's. I'm sure there are more. I don't know. I just haven't found them yet. So the the one thing I want to give um, <laughs> Disney a lot of props for, and I think they're probably like as much as as much criticism as you can have for them as a company and as a business overall. I think the one thing that they are good at doing is making good trailers. I think they're probably some of the best. Like I don't and, know. D- DC tends to have amazing trailers and terrible films. So. That's because DC is, makes one movie with their trailers and a completely different movie with right. their movie. But I, I mean, I feel like that's a talent. I don't know. It's, yeah. But like <laughs> making <laughs> making a good short film is a talent, but making a good short film out of what is a much longer film. Yeah. Less of a town. While also not giving too much away. I don't feel like these trailers ever once spoiled me. No, like most, most it's, it's funny to either rewatch or think back to all of the like theories, videos that people had about, about what's going to happen in these movies. And oh, man. they're almost universally hilariously wow. wrong. So yeah. um, well, I, give... I'm, I'm just going to go out on my, on my very long limb by myself again and be like, I didn't watch any of the trailers. I didn't watch any of the, the theories I wa- I've watched. I ingested none of it. I, I was, uh, I actually, I don't, I don't think I watched a whole lot of, I, I watched the first trailer that was released only because it was before like a Marvel film that I went to see in theaters. But I was living when this film came out, um, I was living with someone who was like an absolute like Star Wars, um, like conspiracy. Fanatic. Yeah, fanatic and conspiracy theorist. And just like we would talk for hours about what like we thought. And again, I think that, yeah, as as, as Josh said, like it, it it goes to show just how good, even after all this time, J.J. Abrams is at keeping the mystery box, like just keeping that approach to trailers and marketing alive. Yeah, I think he's really good. Like, I think he probably had a hand in steering like the trailers and maybe selecting the people that would cut future trailers. Cause I think mm-hmm. even with maybe the exception of solo, but only because they had such little good content to work with um, <laughs> shots fired. But yeah. Um, I think also uh, like Gareth Edwards did a really good job with uh, um, Rogue One too, but like most of that was because like they just shot stuff specifically for trailers. Yeah. Cause like, of just like actors standing around and he would just like grab a camera and shoot them for the trailer. Um, but I think, yeah, like JJ Abrams slash star Wars does a really good job with that. And I think Christopher Nolan is also really good at making trailers that oh yeah are intriguing and also don't give anything away. Mm-hmm. Um, but like the first trailer for this movie was incredibly like even still watching it, I still get goosebumps of just yeah, because you have the whole trailer, you have all these action scenes, and then there's just, I think it's like five solid seconds of just black screen and then silence, and then it just kicks in with the, with the the like the Star Wars fanfare, and you get the, the Millennium Falcon, maybe my best or my favorite shot in the Disney Star mm-hmm. Wars film so far, where it, it does like the. 360 no scope loop de loop. It it does a barrel roll. <laughs> yeah. A um, literal barrel roll. Yeah. And then it come it comes across and you have the two TIE fighters coming straight at you and you just like sl- smash cut to black. It's a good trailer. It's a real good trailer. Um uh, it's just a good movie. 
Yeah. Yeah. So. How many the, Clooney's? Uh, do we want, there's, there's one other big thing that I wanted to talk about that is in the zeitgeist and it'll probably end up being um, in the title of this episode because uh, I want oh. people to see it and get those clicks. <laughs> um, so before, but I guess we can do it after we give our Clooney's because it's not actually related to this film, but it is related to something that happened recently in Star Wars that I want to um, wanted to talk about. Oh. Um, I'm good either way. We can talk before or after. We'll do I, Clooney's in case anyone yeah. doesn't want to, in case people are not interested in what we, about breaking news. Um <laughs> But who, who, who on, who on this, on God's green earth would not want to hear? Yeah, really, if you're listening to all of our Star Wars podcasts, really, yeah. you're, you're just in it for the Star Wars. You, like, you, be need, honest, you, need you to want more content. Make some friends. You need to go outside. No, we're all the friends you need. Don't listen to these <laughs> fools. <laughs> There's a whole whopping four of us, sometimes six. You, you, need, just you need, need to us. call your parents and tell them you love them. Or maybe they need to call you. I don't know. I don't know your life. <laughs> uh, I'm going to give this uh, 8.5 on the old Clooney meter. Wow. it's a lot of Cloonies. Yeah. And again, like, I would say it's a sliding scale on a different scale from the original trilogy. Oh, maybe yeah. on the same scale. Like, those, that's a completely different scale, yeah. honestly. Um, but I would I would probably put this this would be with on the prequel scale, um, so compared to what I gave those, I would say this is an eight point five for me. Checks out. Anybody else want to give their cleanies? <laughs> no, no um, I, I'm going to go opposite of you, Josh, and this is on my sliding scale with the original trilogy because the prequels. If it was on the prequel scale, the prequels would be like negative. Billions. Whoa, that's, that's a bit. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Um, and I would say I would give this nine. Mm. I, this, it was so amazing to be back into this universe that, that you've fallen in love with as children. Cause most of us watched it as children and fallen in love with. And I never thought it was going to come back well and yeah. to have this movie exceeded all of my expectations. I was just excited to be back into Star Wars and to hope that it was going to be a little better than the prequels. And it blew it out of the fucking water for me. It was amazing. It was great. And I'm so, I was so happy and I'm still very happy that Star Wars is back in our lives. Jonathan, what are your Clooney's? Um, I think I have to piggyback off of Heather's and go with a nine just because of what I had said earlier um, about seeing the trailer and then uh, going and sitting in the theater and having the movie just firing on all cylinders the entire time and just really hitting every single mark that I wanted it to. So this one, this one gets a nine from me. Harley. Harley. Oh, Can't yeah. Sorry. Saying. Holy shit. I was spacing out hard there. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, I'm actually going to be the asshole that just totally throws the curve. I would say, if I remember correctly, I think on my sliding scale for the for the um, the original trilogy, I gave um, a new hope. Uh, I think I gave it an eight. I believe like an eight, an eight point five. Anyways, I, I'm just going to assume that I gave a new hope an eight. In which case, I would also give this film an eight. I would give the exact same film, the exact. I would give it the exact same rating because it hit all of the exact same beats in the exact same way that I wanted it to. Um, I think if I were rating this on how it made me feel at the time, considering that we hadn't had Star Wars and, you know, God knows how long and just never really thought that we were going to get that again. You know, this I, I, I'm, I'm going to have my here's the thing moment in that, again, I would give this film with that in mind, like a 20 out of 10. Like, I don't even care. But for me, <laughs> this film was fun. It was, you know, just a, a great, like, summer block best, blockbuster sci-fi romp in a universe that I love. Um, I wouldn't say that it's my favorite Star Wars film, only because uh, Return of the – or oh, The Empire Strikes Back exists, and I think that that film only <sighs> bettered its 
fellow films by being just a little bit more nuanced, which is, I think is kind of what I was hoping um, the uh, the last Jedi was going to be, but we'll talk about that. But um, again, yeah, and overall a great film. It, it did everything that I was hoping for. And I think it really did single handedly, you know, revive not only the series, but also, you know, just kind of my, my, my childlike wonder in, in the universe of star Wars. Cool. Yeah, I think we're all pretty much on the same page here. It's like you can't it's too fun to hate yeah. unless you're just like super salty about all the women and black stormtroopers. Yeah. An incel <laughs> fuckboy. Um like like also like with, with that being said, like if you don't enjoy a movie, that's fine. Like I'm yeah. like it's it's like if you don't like it because of those reasons, that's stupid. But if you're like Star Wars, like this isn't for me, like I can't argue that because there are plenty of movies that I like that lots of people enjoy. Um, like I'm never going to watch a Fast and Furious movie and I'm okay with that. Um, but I mean, have you watched Tokyo Drift? Because that film is <laughs> wowie zowie. I, it's the I Jonah Hex you, of uh, Fast and the How Furious. How fucking dare you <laughs> mention that film in my non-presence? <laughs> yeah, I agree with you, Josh. It's it's fine to not like a, a movie. You know, if Star Wars isn't your thing, then why are you listening to our podcast first off? But secondly, <laughs> um, keep listening. Yeah, I mean, keep listening to the podcast. But why did you make it this yeah. far into this episode? But, that, like, um, you know, if you don't like Star Wars, it's just not your thing. That's fine. But when you stop, when you start not liking things because basic human rights reasons, like that's that's where it's not okay like if you don't like it because a woman you don't want a woman to be your main character like then i have massive issues with you i mean no no likes to stand on in that regard but i mean there it's not a perfect film and i think you can definitely find some things to criticize and um that aren't obviously terrible and make you a bad person but (laughs) but uh i don't know um so now that we have uh, our boring uh, Disney conversation out of the way, uh, there's there's something something happened uh, over the last week that we have not. It, this is the first episode we'll be releasing since it happened. I'm um, so curious. I, I need to know. <laughs> recently, Disney Plus <gasps> um, premiered on the old as as a streaming platform. We have uh, uh, we have one Mandalorian episode up so far and by the time this goes up we might have our second episode up on that we are reviewing Woo-hoo. all of the episodes on that so uh keep an eye on that it'll be and a lot of fun i haven't been on any of those episodes except i am going to start hopefully being on the next one so if you've been missing out on your best friend harley don't worry babies he's on his way <laughs> um i'm really excited about um harley watching Maybe. episode two because there's some there's some stuff that happens there. I feel like I'm going to be able to hear Harley watch episode two, <laughs> even though we are several miles apart from each other. Yeah, I am like a good solid like 60 miles apart from each other. I think I am, I'm going to be able to hear Harley. I am, I am concerned and excited and maybe even slightly aroused, but we will see. Um. But the other other people are not aroused. <laughs> Hopefully maybe, not. Please don't. Maybe not. Please happen. don't tell us you're aroused. <laughs> <laughs> you know. No. Know no. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, but the other big news to come out of the Star Wars Disney Plus, um, <laughs> I wanted to talk about our mad lad, George Lucas. McClunky? McClunky. Oh, um, boy. God, I don't want to talk about McClunky. <laughs> Um, Roses are red. This wampa tastes funky. George Lucas is an ass. Greedo said McClunky. There you go. You heard it here. McClunky. <laughs> you heard it here first, people. That's my um, haiku. That's my haiku for your asses. I was that a haiku? Absolutely not. I think, I think that was a limerick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what. <laughs> McClunky is all you have to say. Like, yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, so apparently this was heard, um, of, heard of the cries of a thousand of a thousand hearts all at once at fucking McClunky. Yeah. Um I guess <laughs> I guess this was part of George Lucas preparing for the like the four K release that he was gonna do yeah. um back in I think two thousand eleven. 
And it's it's just another just another notch on George Lucas's belt of not understanding his own thing that he created, which is such a bizarre. I just don't understand like his like I mean at this point we have to acknowledge like this is an obsession with this one scene and like its nuance and I just don't I don't get where he's coming from at all. I think there is an argument in his head that <laughs> he believes one hundred percent. Yeah. And he just thinks that if he if he if he frames it in the right way, everyone else is going to get it. But I don't think he understands the fan base that he is trying to convince. Yeah, never. They, they will never be happy at this point. So they, do you they've think been, in, in George blood. Lucas's mind, we're all confused on who shot first? Or do you think that he thinks there's a completely different argument being had in the fan base? from between whether Han shot first or not. Do you think he's like, maybe they just didn't understand what Kino was trying to say? Which was I, McClunky. Yeah. Which was McClunky. I think, I think in his head, it, it makes Han Solo unforgivable to have shot first. And I don't think he ever wanted it that way either. It's also one of the things because, um, this scene was kind of thrown together at the last minute off of the back of deleting the job of the hut scene, which was um, also controversially re put into the special editions of star Wars, which is why a lot of the dialogue is exactly the same, which is why Han Solo says exactly the same thing in both scenes. Um, and I think it was, um, is it Gary Kurtz? I think was one of the producers, his longtime producer on this, on these ones. Um, and also George Lucas's now ex-wife who edited and pretty much made start the original um, A New Hope what it was. And I just think like it was one of those things where he never wanted it that way. And uh, he he thinks that he, if he keeps tweaking it, then we'll all see what he saw. But I, I don't think that time is ever I think he's going to be disappointed that no one ever, no one's going to, else is going to see it that way. I agree. Um, which, and um, I saw someone else also mention too, of like, this is the first thing that people have noticed. Like, was this the, this the only thing he changed the first thing he changed or is there other stuff yet? Because uh, I have not watched any of the other original trilogy on Disney plus yet. So I'm, I'm I wondering either. if and there's going to be, <laughs> if there's more is. nuggets that worries me. I, I like. I, I imagine that we're gonna get like flashbacks to Hayden Christensen as Anakin Skywalker, <sighs> or maybe uh, ooh, inserting the shots of Natalie Portman from Revenge of the Sith into Return of the Jedi when she's talking about remembering seeing her mother. That would be cool. <laughs> that be that would be super dope, and I would love that. Um, so yeah, you know George. What? I'm always willing to see more Natalie Portman. I mean, not wrong, but um, our our mad lad George Lucas, unable to refer, refer, re refrain refrain. What I wanted to say, refrain himself, but that's not what I'm trying to say. Re restrain, restrain himself. That's the one. <laughs> Man, I'm going. Our, I'm going full wow, Harley tonight. Is, you had a, you had a, you had a will moment. always and forever <laughs> continue painting the same painting, even though everybody said, "Please, for the love of God, stop! That's too much paint." It's like that Jesus picture. If the same original artist had done the potato version as well as the original <laughs> version. <laughs> uh, um. I love it. Uh, does Jonathan well, have any uh, McClunky, <laughs> McClunky tidbits he wants to? Yeah. Um, I will just. Uh, I, you all know I'm, I'm a, I'm a fan of recycling. <laughs> so uh, the only thing that I'll say about McClunky is that uh, it's weird for them to call out the unknown. Uh, Culkin brother, because <laughs> I dare you to say McClunky Culkin and not smile. Uh, I can't I can. even. I can't even think about saying it without laughing. That's, uh... oh, man. <laughs> um, man, I'm gonna have to title. Oh, this episode God. is now going to have to be called The McClunky Culkin Awakens. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not even mad. <laughs> oh. uh, um, I think Shit. 
I think that about does it. Yeah, I think <laughs> we've I think we've bled this horse dry. Is that the right? Is that a mixed metaphor? We we I... bled the horse to water, but we can't make a drink. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, that's that dark. work. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's some stupid uh, shit. <laughs> so uh, I guess I just want to leave uh, everyone. Uh, thank you all for listening. Hit up our uh, our uh, Instagram page. It has links to all of our shows. Oh yeah, smash um, that like button. His Dork Materials, uh, the Action Boys podcast, which uh, another weekend where I'm editing and releasing three videos on the same day or Woo-hoo, three podcasts job, on the same Josh. day. So. Thanks, That'll guys. be exciting. One of them that we're going to record that same day because I like the quick turnarounds on the historic materials to mm-hmm. keep them in the zeitgeist. So uh, yeah, that'll be fun. So come back. Um, actually, not come back. Head on over there right now. It's probably up. Well, historic materials is a little later in the night. Uh, but we also have Action Boys podcast. But head on over to our Instagram at Moist Boys Podcast. I put up pictures all the time. Um, I make allusions to us doing cocaine while watching Amelia Clark Christmas movies. So that's fun. <laughs> um, make, make sure you. If only we had. Right? If only we had. That <laughs> could have been a very different movie. <laughs> Make nope, it. I don't think it. Nope, yeah. I think it would have probably been close to the same movie. Yeah. <laughs> oh. um, <laughs> make make sure y'all follow us on a foot wiki. That's, uh, where yeah. I do, that's where I do the majority of my best work. So, um, if you want to see pictures of Harley's feet on Instagram, head on over to our Patreon page, patreoncom yeah. podcast. If we get to hundred dollars a month in Patreon uh, subscribers, Harley's gonna we're gonna hashtag get Harley on Graham. Get me on the Hashtag gram. Get Harley on gram. Get me on the gram, babies. And yeah. Uh, so to uh, to close out this episode, I just want to read this little bit of <laughs> Star Wars: The oh. Force Awakens on the IMDb trivia. Oh. Um, this film is not a reboot and is a direct sequel to Star Wars Episode Six: Return of the Jedi, which take which it takes place 30 years after you don't False. get that kind of information anywhere oh, else I, <laughs> other wait, than I, IMDB trivia. Was that a question or was that a, yes. <laughs> what is false? <laughs> uh, what is McClunky? McClunky. <laughs> McClunky Culkin. Uh, the third <laughs> elusive brother. <laughs> It's like Sasquatch and Loch Ness Monster had a baby. Ooh. All right. Bye, guys. Love you. I'm clunky. <laughs>